we have discussed pulses before and loosely covered some of the concepts about what they might be, but never really dived into the detail of why they pulse and what alternative theories there are and what gaps there might be. I would like to spend some time going over Pratt and Healy's concept for the radiation emissions from pulsars and then discuss some of the open questions that exist around how this would fit into the electric star concept. The first pulsars were detected back in 1967 when an investigation was carried out by Bell and Hewish of extragalactic radio sources. They were able to measure a repeating signal every 1.337 seconds. This source seemed to be coming from within our own galaxy. Soon more of these objects were detected, and all seemed to be originating from within our galaxy. Due to the stability of their pulse period, Thomas Gold first postulated back in 1968 that these pulsars must be highly magnetized, rapidly rotating neutron stars. This model described these objects as having high energy plasma beams emitting from the poles of a spinning neutron star and accelerating along the star's dipole magnetic field. Since then, all observations of these objects have followed the same lighthouse model concept. But many problems remain with this model. How the relativistic electron beams are produced and why they possess the observed polarization are a major problem any model must address. Peratt and Healy were the first to propose an alternative mechanism. They identified a series of features that pulsars have that any model must address, and these included the intensity of the radio luminosity, a pulse range width between several seconds right down to milliseconds, a pulse profile which can consist of one, two, or three components, a slow decrease of the pulse width with increasing frequency and with increasing period. A slow increase of the periodicity, but a much slower increase for the millisecond pulsars. Glitches which cause jumps in the period. An interpulse period in between the main pulses. A continuous low power background signal. Erratic pulse to pulse amplitude fluctuations. A very high Doppler interpreted velocity. And the global pulsar system and topology which extends beyond the pulsar and includes wisps, jets, and other features symmetrically oriented beyond the active region. There are many suggestions that have been put forward which address one or two of these features, but none so far are able to address all of them together. Peratt and Healy were the first to put forward a model which could address almost all of these features at once. Michel and Desler had previously proposed that pulsars have what they describe as a fossil disk, the purpose of the disk was to solve the problem of charges in a co-rotating magnetosphere. This would also explain the difference in the increasing time period of fast and slow pulses. This material in the disk would be mostly in the plasma state. Peratt and Healy then logically assumed that it was highly likely that this material was electromagnetically coupled to the magnetosphere via field-aligned currents. They modelled this connection like a transmission line model, and this is similar to the way that planetary magnetospheres are described. Any disturbance in the transmission line, such as an arc discharge, will result in the initiation of travelling waves which propagate towards the end of the line, where they may be reflected, modified, attenuated, distorted, until they die out. In a lossless line with perfect end conductors, the pulse propagates back and forth forever. In reality, kinetic energy of the relativistic currents flowing along the guide magnetic field is lost in synchrotron radiation. Peratt and Healy conducted both simulations and extensive tests on this model and found that they were able to recreate double and single hump current profiles and voltage pulses that reverse polarity over the current profile. They believe that the relativistic current flowing at the surface is what is responsible for the pulsar emissions. The spatial extent of the current is determined by the depth to which the incident wave propagates. This is determined by the response of the lower pulse of magnetosphere to an incident electromagnetic pulse. They were also able to recreate the different types of polarization seen in pulsar emissions. 
they proposed two different configurations. The long transmission line, which would have a plasma disk located around the equator with connections along the magnetic field line back to the poles. And then the short transmission line where the disk is located at a much higher latitude. When they scale this to the size of the magnetosphere, then the entire line acts as a continuous source of low level radiation and noise. This is one of the features that we had previously mentioned that the standard model cannot easily explain. All quasars emit a background radiation even between pulses. In the experiment that they ran, they were even able to reproduce glitches that occurred when the magnetic insulation failed and breakdown occurred that matched the signature of those observed in pulses. Both the simulation and the experiment seem to suggest that the micropulses and subpulses are produced by particle wave interactions across this connection from the poles to the disk as the pulses travel from the middle to the poles and back again. At the poles, the interaction with the surface not only creates the reflected waves, but can alter it, creating subpulses or changes in its strength. The source of the pulses is therefore not the pulsar itself, but the magnetosphere and its interaction with the surrounding that creates the pulses. These are not directed like a search beam, but act more like an antenna that pulses due to the relativistic electrons racing across them in each of these pulses. It was Peratt and Alvin's view that the source of the radiation energy was not contained in the pulsar, but instead originated in the interaction with its environment or by energy delivered by an external circuit. And that external circuit is the same circuit that would power an electric star. But something has happened to change the environment or the connection causing a dramatic change to the normal operation. Now, instead of the ions being directed in a stream out along the equatorial axis, instead we see huge jets from the poles. But what could cause these jets to be created at the poles if this is where the incoming current resides? One piece of this puzzle may come from Hannes Alvin. In his book, The Evolution of the Solar System, he discusses some of the lesser known theories on the formation of the solar system and discusses why some of them are not possible. In one, he discusses a concept that I think may well explain this phenomena that we see in pulsars, and maybe also some of the, in quotes, young stars that seem to have jets as well. He was discussing why you cannot have a toroidal field that continues to store vast amounts of magnetic energy. He goes on to state that Lindbergh and Jakobsen demonstrated this experimentally and showed that if a toroidal component of a magnetic field becomes too large compared to the poloidal component, an instability occurs which transfers energy from the toroidal to the poloidal field. So could it be that in the pulsar's case, the incoming energy is so large that the magnetic energy stored in the torus far outweighs the energy in the poloidal field, and a sudden or continuous transfer of energy occurs from the toroidal field into the poloidal field, and that this extra magnetic energy accelerates material out of the poles. Could it be that the central object is no longer connected like an electric star, but instead the energy is being poured directly into the disk around the pulsar, which is then transferring energy to the pulsar's poloidal field, ejecting material and initiating the pulses along the bridge, connecting the disk to the surface. In the case of pulsars, the beams emitted are thought to be relativistic electron beams. Going back to the concept of the electric sun, we would have to question where these electrons come from. Remember, normally stars are electron deficient, drawing in electrons and throwing out ions. But here we almost have the reverse. Does some process cause the incoming electrons to become trapped and that they don't deionize like normal? Are they then violently ejected? The question would be, why would this happen? Is the star no longer positively charged, but now somehow has become negatively charged? Even then, this does not explain how relativistic electrons can be ejected. Normally, this requires something like an exploding double layer. But here, we have to bear in mind that these beams seem to be almost continuous, rather than a one-off event. And it sort of reminds me of Eric Lerner's plasmoid model where the beams are created out of the poles as the plasma forms into a toroid and is compressed. 
and the energy is transferred again here from the toroidal field to the poloidal field. So could a similar process be working here? That the failure of the star leads to a rapid compression of the plasma surrounding the star, creating a plasmoid? The problem here is, would there really be enough plasma to create a plasmoid that would last long enough? Is it possible to conceive of a model that would allow a plasmoid to be fed externally? Now this is something that will require a lot more investigation work. We have some of the pieces, but to me it's not all adding up. So this is something that I do want to try and focus on, particularly in conjunction with the work that I've done in trying to sort of get to the detail of understanding the electric sun model. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.